From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Mayhood, I sent you a copy of Lansing's insurance examination this morning. Did you get it all right? Yes, I did, Doctor. Thank you very much. Just looked it over. And I take it everything's all right. It's an exact duplicate of the one sent to the insurance company, and that part's okay. But it doesn't straighten out matters on this case. I'm not concerned with your case particularly. I just hope you're through bothering me, Mr. Dollar. Not quite. What does that mean? I want another hour of your time, Doctor. I want you to go over to the coroner's office with me and look at Mr. Lansing's body. What for? To identify it. I've got to know if he's the man you examined or not. About an hour? Doctor, I can get an injunction. All right. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Tucson, Arizona. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is a further accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lansing fraud. Or was it a fraud? Expense account item three, $10, loan. To Jim Carter, who was working with me on the case. Thanks, buddy. I'll pay you back as soon as I can cash a check. Been so busy, I haven't had time. How's your doctor friend? Well, I'm going to pick him up pretty soon and go over to the coroner's office. I want him to look at James Lansing and see if he's the same man he passed on the insurance examination two years ago. Either we insured the wrong man or Dr. Mayhood examined the wrong man. I don't know which. How have you done so far? Well, besides what I told you yesterday about Dr. Mayhood? Yeah. Well, he's in healthy financial shape. Not good or bad, but, you know, healthy. His house halfway paid for, he owns one car outright, and has eight months to go on another one. All of which doesn't mean anything if he phonied up an insurance examination. Yeah, that's true, kiddo, that's true. You know, I've been thinking, this would have worked, but James Lansing died on the street and the city performed an autopsy. Death, malnutrition. For a private physician, without an autopsy hanging over him, it could have been heart failure or most anything. Jim, I think we can do whatever we want around here. Step on anybody's toes, make any kind of noise we like. With this kind of situation to investigate, we don't have to be careful. Easy, Johnny. Lansing's body's in the morgue. There's no doubt that it's him, Exhibit A. But we aren't sure that his $50,000 policy was issued legitimately. What are you getting to? Call the state insurance commission, Jim. Let them know we think this is a bad one from top to bottom. Let them know that so that when the beneficiary starts to complain, they can tell her. It might scare her and whoever helped her into being more ridiculous than they've been already. I'm going to hold off, Johnny. Why? Till I see how you and Dr. Mayhood make out at the morgue. Expense account item four, two dollars, cab fare. From my hotel to the Valley National Building. I picked up a scowling Dr. Mayhood and we drove over to the coroner's office. Mr. Dollar, this is a waste of your time and mine. Sorry to inconvenience you, doctor, but it's necessary. Uh, I suppose so. And I suppose you have a job to do. But I have a job, too. Mr. Franks, the insurance broker, telephones me and says he's sending over a man for a physical. I do the physical. It's immaterial to me whether the man I examine is qualified for insurance or not. My job is to examine him. It's up to the insurance company to determine... Yeah? Johnny Dollar, this is Dr. Mayhood. I believe Sergeant Younger phoned. Yeah, yeah, this way. Dollar, it's up to the insurance company to do what they want to about the examination. I understand all that, Doctor. Then don't ignore it with your high-pressure tactics. Because examination is the only part I have to do with this business. I examined a man named James Lansing two years ago. You have a copy of my findings on that examination. I stand on them. And don't forget it. I don't forget for one minute. Nor do I forget that what you found and what an autopsy surgeon found are completely different opinions on Lansing's physical condition. Here we go, boys. There's the body. Pull the sheet back, please. Yeah. Well, Doctor? I called my lawyer after you called me today. I won't be intimidated, Mr. Dollar. You aren't being intimidated, Doctor. You're being asked to cooperate. Then maybe I don't like the way you ask for cooperation. My attorney will be in my office to represent me if you bother me any more about this. You want to look at this body? Your attorney can't refute what's already been established, Doctor. You pronounced James Lansing in good physical condition two years ago. An autopsy report shows that when he died two days ago, he was in very bad physical condition. 
So bad that two years ago, he couldn't possibly have gone through a careful examination in your office without some of the symptoms being detected by you. Where is your medical degree and what responsibility? Oh, why don't you shut up and take a look and tell me if you've ever seen this man before? I won't be spoken to that way. Just a minute. I'll get an injunction and I'll charge malpractice and negligence if I have to. Oh? On what grounds? You're being stupid, doctor. All you have to do is look at that corpse and tell me if he's the man you examined in your office two years ago. Well? I don't know whether I've seen this man before or not. Well, does he look familiar in any way? I can't say. I might have examined this man. I don't know. This is James Lansing, Doctor. The name you filled in on your physical examination for the insurance. I know that. Is this the man you examined? I don't know. I honestly don't know. It was two years ago. If I see a man for three hours in the course of a physical examination, am I expected to remember his face or any details about him two years later? Is there any way you can determine whether or not this is the man you examined in your office? No. Not that I know of. Is there any way you can determine it? Believe me, Doctor, I can try. And I did try. That afternoon, over the protest of Dr. Mayhood, I took all of the personnel connected with his office down to the morgue. A nurse, a receptionist, the x-ray technician, and a laboratory worker. None of them recognized the body of James Lansing. Expense account item five, ten cents, one phone call to Jim Carter who'd spent the day preparing the necessary forms for the insurance commission and gathering data on Lansing's beneficiary. You think Dr. Mayhood was in on it? He's too mad, too belligerent, Jim. You don't sound too sure. Well, and maybe he just strikes me as an inept doctor. Well, let's say Mayhood's way down on my list. He examined a man who said he was James Lansing. It could have been anybody. All right, we'll let it go that way for a while. Any ideas? I'm on my way out to Lansing's old address. He had an apartment on the other side of town. I want to see how he's lived out there. Still want me to go ahead with the insurance commission? Yeah, go ahead. The manager at James Lansing's apartment house happened to be a woman named Anita Regan. She also happened to be willing to go back down to the coroner's office with me and view the mortal remains. There you are. Oh. Have you ever seen this man before, Mrs. Regan? Yes, yes, sir. That's that's Mr. Lansing, apartment 34. You're positive? Oh, yes. I've seen him every day for almost two years. Okay. Want to smoke? I want to get out of here. Oh, sure. I don't know why I'm acting this way. He doesn't look any different now than he's looked before. I've seen him stretched out like that a hundred times. One? I mean, almost like that. Out, stony. Only I guess it's because I knew he was just drunk then, not dead. Oh, I see. He was crazy carrying on the way he did. <laughs> Feels good to be out in the sunlight again. Yeah. I'll take that smoke now, Mr. Fowler. Oh, sure. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Lansing used to get up around 10 every morning. He'd look awful, but he was always kind of nice, polite, you know. He'd be regular as clockwork. He'd walk past my door and tip his hat and go right down to the store and come back in a little while with a sack of groceries, a bottle of milk for his cat, some donuts for himself, and some booze. Uh And then he'd just lock himself up in his apartment and stay there all day, drinking. Real alcoholic, huh? Well, I'd say so. At least I wasn't surprised he starved to death. He can't live on whiskey. He was fried to the ears by noon every day, as long as I knew him. Mr. Lansing didn't work then. Well, I think he tried to sell real estate once, a long time ago. Oh? But how could he? I understand he was a retired engineer or something like that. He pays rent? Oh, yes. Always seemed to have enough money to get along. Did he have any family, Mrs. Regan? Well, I know he's got a sister living in town somewhere. What about his friends? They seem to do all his drinking alone. Say, you're from the insurance company. You should know about his family. Apparently, there are a lot of things we don't know. Hmm? A man named James Lansing moved into your apartment house two years ago. He didn't work, but he had enough money for his rent and his liquor. He also had enough money to buy some expensive insurance. Very expensive. Somehow, he passed an insurance examination, and then he suddenly died. No one, nothing. Just one beneficiary. Mr. Dollar, you don't suppose somebody just gave him enough money to get along so he'd drink himself to death, do you? 
That's one way of looking at him, Mrs. Regan. Oh, that poor man. That poor, poor man. I spent another hour with Mrs. Regan, gathering as much background as I could about the last two years of James Lansing's life. I also spoke to the janitor of the building and two of the tenants. They all verified the fact that Lansing had been drinking heavily for better than 18 months prior to his death. No one seemed to know why. Jim Carter had an answer. I talked to our man in L.A., Johnny. Lansing lived there before he came to Tucson. He had several arrests for drunkenness, never married. One time he made his living as an engineer. Finally, he got fired for drinking on the job. <sighs> yeah, just one of those chronic cases. First arrest was back in 1939. How's the beneficiary holding him? The sister? Yeah. Well, Mrs. Kennedy was pretty upset when the insurance commission notified her we were in town making an investigation, indignant, put out, things like that. She wanted to know how long it would take. This all comes secondhand from the insurance commission. Uh, Johnny, hmm? a broker named Hillary Franks sold a policy. What have you got on him? Hillary Franks has represented worldwide insurance in this area for 17 years. Uh... <sighs> You're stalling, kiddo. Sure, I'm stalling, Jim. Because we're right down to the meat of it now, and it makes me sick. There's only one person who stood to benefit by having James Lansing insured. That's the beneficiary, his sister, Arlene Kennedy. So? Jim, you know as well as I do, somebody else had to take the physical examination in Dr. Mayhood's office. Someone had to help her arrange that. Someone had to help her get Lansing's signature on the policies. She couldn't have pulled it off by herself without gumming it up. She had to have expert help. Hillary Franks. Yeah, Hillary Franks. 17 years, broker, worldwide insurance company. Okay, the salesman's the first one to come under suspicion in a case like this, outside of the beneficiary, so let's get on with it. All right, Jim. Uh, one thing. What? Hillary Franks knows we'll be looking at him, and he knows he's under suspicion. That worry you? A little bit. After 17 years in the business, he should also know where we're going to be before we get there. If he did something as dumb as try to work a $50,000 fraud on his own insurance company, he might do something even dumber. If so... Well, what's the 38, Jim? Here. From now on, Johnny, you better carry this. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Lansing Fraud tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, tomorrow there's a bit of excitement when a pair of thieves start a falling out. Matter of fact, a lot of excitement. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>